Man, I've got some fun stuff up here today, and uh, I've been working, you know, my throat, and uh, I finally found a doctor that I like. He said, if you'll drink three Cokes, he said, that'll help your throat, so praise God. It's always good to find a doctor that tells you what you want to hear, isn't that right? So we'll work on that a little bit. Praise God. You love God? Well, let me pray, and we'll get into the Word today. We'll get into what we're going to do. Father, thank you today for your goodness. God, you're such a wonderful, awesome, heavenly Father. Thank you for all of your blessings. Lord, we thank you for those that are here today, those that are joining us online. God, we just pray, God, that uh, you would open our eyes and our hearts to receive. God, open our ears to hear what you're saying to us today. Lord, we thank you for revelation, knowledge into your word. Uh, God, we just bless you and we thank you. Father, anyone that's here today, God, that needs healing in their body, we thank you that you're the healer. Your word de- des- describes yourself. Self-proclaimed, Father, that you are our healer. You are Jehovah Rapha. So, Father, we thank you that you are the great I am, not the great I was. So, Father, we thank you. We declare that by your stripes we are healed, that your healing power is actively in our body, driving out any sickness, disease. We thank you, Father, that no pestilence, no virus, nothing like that, God, comes nigh our dwelling, comes nigh the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is our bodies. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, if you agreed with that, give me an amen. Amen. Well, listen, we've been talking about, uh, we've been talking about in a series uh, some end time events. Um, we've talked about the rapture. We've talked about uh, signs that were leading up to uh, the rapture, the catching away. You know, a lot of times people say, you know, that's the, the second coming of the Lord. And actually, that's not the second coming of the Lord. Uh, remember, when was the first coming of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ? When was his first coming? In Bethlehem, remember he came as a, born as a baby right in a manger. When he comes back, the second coming of the Lord, he comes all the way down to the earth. That will be after the tribulation. Uh, during a thousand uh, millennial reign, we'll come with him. He'll bring his church with him and we'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Uh, but the, the, the rapture is Jesus steps out of the, the Bible says steps out of the heaven, steps out of the, from the third heaven, perhaps to the, to the atmospheric heaven and calls his church home. And that's when the Bible says that those who have died, people that are Christians, uh, believers, they, they've already to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. They're already with the Lord, but their bodies will be resurrected. And the Bible says that, that, uh, we will not precede those who have already died, but we'll be caught up together with them in the air after they're raised, we're raised. I mean, it's all in the twinkling of an eye. It all happens that fast. And we're only, not only translated, but we're transformed. We get our new bodies then as well. As I said in this series, we are the exceptional generation. And uh, the exception is that the exception to the scripture in Hebrews, it says that it's appointed a man once to die and then the judgment. Well, if you're living when Jesus steps out of the cloud, you won't die. You'll just be translated and transformed then uh, and, and go to heaven. And then, of course, we talked about the seven years of tribulation would be a, a horrible time. Uh, remember, there's three thoughts with that. Three beliefs, pre-trib, which is obviously pre-tribulation, mid-trib, which is after three and a half years, the church will go through three and a half years of tribulation, and then they'll be taken out, and then the, 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 the worst of the worst happens the second uh, three and a half years. And uh, so, I, again, I believe uh, pre-trib, not just because I just think that that's what Scripture teaches, but there's other people that, that are just as strong and believe the other way. Of course, one of the verses that we used uh, in that pre-trib Scripture is First uh, Thessalonians chapter, chapter uh, 1, verse 10. Let's go back half of verse 9. It says, how, are you, I say, how and how you turn to God from idols and serve the living true God. Verse 10 says this, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the coming wrath. And that coming wrath, again, is the, is the tribulation. The church is rescued. And we, we didn't just stand on that verse. There was other verses that we shared. So if you weren't here or if you uh, weren't uh, privy to any of those messages, they're all online. Go to our website under messages, archives, and look under the series. Um, what was the name of it? Uh, is the end near? It's really, really is the end here. So again, watch those things. And um, you know, is it, again, is it, is it, is it pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? Here's my philosophy with that. Here's my philosophy with that. Hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Hope for the pre-trib, prepare for the post-trib. Be ready. And here's the, here's, the, here's the bottom line dollar I tell people that are, that are walking on the line. I said, whatever you do, if you, don't make up, if you don't make it in the rapture and you go through the tribulation, don't receive what? 
the mark of the beast. Don't receive the mark of the beast. If you do, it's doomed. You're doomed to hell. But there's possibility that people will be saved in the tribulation. I think that the Bible uh, teaches that as well. So, but, you know, as we finish this series, I want to, uh, because I do believe that we are the, in the, the last generation, uh, that all the things that need to transpire uh, of prophecies and things have been in this generation since 1948. And uh, so I do believe that we're close uh, to the Lord stepping out of the clouds and calling his church home. I do believe that. So from time to time, uh, as, as things show up in, 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 uh, in the news, I'll bring your attention to it. We won't do a stop and do a whole series around it, but just kind of mention, say, for example, you know, the Bible says that in the last days that uh, in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse I think it's one through five. There was 19 things in there. You know, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, children will be disobedient to their parents. Well, gosh, Jesus should have come back a long time ago because those things have been happening. But we see those things happening on an accelerated scale. And, uh, and so, I mean, this was just another thing that we see. We said there'll be, uh, you know, in the last days, one of the things that's going to happen is, is persecution on the church and people uh, coming against people standing in faith and believing. There was just uh, in the news the other day, uh, a 57-year-old and a 72-year-old, two women that worked at Kroger were fired because they refused to wear uh, a, a new apron that, that Kroger's came up with. That's a grocery store celebrating the LGBT uh, community. And they said because of their religious belief, they asked to be uh, exempt from that or at least to put a patch over the, the emblem uh, of that. Or could they buy, could they buy another apron? Uh, without that and they were told no and they refused to so they they were they were fired so I'm thinking again just in the, I'm telling you those things especially will wax worse and worse people coming against uh, the church so again get ready for that um, so again on the on the heels on the heels of of this series uh, considering uh, you know the events of the tribulation and again what Jesus said about it and here's what Jesus said He said, it'll be the greatest years of anguish. The tribulation will be the greatest years of anguish that the world has ever seen and will ever see again. It's going to be horrible. Just some synonyms, just kind of give you a clue. Anguish uh, is is agony, pain, torment, suffering, distress, misery, sorrow, grief. Uh, It's going to be a horrible, horrible time. In fact, it's going to be so bad that the, the Bible tells us that that time had to be cut short. If not, there's not a person in the world that would have survived that, that period of time. So I want to ask you this question today is, is, is this, what action, what preparation should we be making? What should we do knowing that and believing that, that the end is close? Again, what, what exactly should we be doing? And if we take, again, the, the parable that Jesus told of the ten virgins, we know that five were wise and five were foolish. The five wise made preparation and the five foolish lacked preparation. So again, I think certainly that we should, we should be wise and make preparation in our life for our family, people that we love, people that we care about, and, and making, making that. You know, when I think of the, I think of the 10 virgins, I just, and this is not, not scriptural, this is my thinking, my imagination. I see 10 giddy virgins, see 10 giddy women that are excited about the bridegroom and giggling and he so this and he so that. You know, just again, these are all... Uh, an analogy of that but you think of that the wedding party and and the excitement there but the question is what happened what happened to the five what happened to the five foolish and I, I guess what I would say is perhaps that maybe they lost their mojo and I think that that's sometimes that's a that's a picture of the church because sometimes you can almost see it when you talk about over the last you know 30 40 years you know Jesus is coming soon Jesus is coming soon you almost say that and you see people roll their eyes yeah I've been hearing that all my life and so it's easy to kind of just kind of lose, uh, lose your mojo, to lose, uh, to lose your fizz, if we could put it in a, in a soda term. So with that being said, I'm going to drink this water. All right, so I have some, uh, I have some sodas here. So, so when I open up, this is an ice cold. How many of you love an ice cold pop? You love that? Okay. If, if you're good and you listen, you amen loud, I will give you this. Of course, I just drank out of it, but I, I, I'm cleared. Uh, no, no, so, no, we won't do that today. But this is a nice ice cold Coke. I mean, it is so good. So you know pr- what's going to happen when, when I open this up, right? And you know what? When you open a Coke, isn't there things? Don't, do you listen for something? Yeah. You know, you're obviously going to hit 10. Did you find me a glass? I did. You did? Can I have that up here? Thank you. 
Look at her. She brought a plate. I asked her to bring me a, yeah, anyone, whatever you want. There you go. This one right here is good. Thank you. Appreciate that. So when we open up, when we open up this coat, we expect to hear, that was good, wasn't it? Let me do that again. Not, that just means tin dripping. It means, uh-oh, there's something. How many of you have ever opened up a, a, a can of Coke or some kind of pop and it was flat? And you just opened it up. Something, if something happened, the pressure got out of it. But if I open this up, oh, yeah, baby. What do we expect to happen when I pour this in here? Oh, can you hear that? Ooh, get my microphone dirty. This, I, I need to test it to make sure it's good. That was good. And uh, so that's, again, that's what we expect. Now, how many of you have ever opened up a can of Coke and, uh, and, and you set it down and you went off and you did something else and you came back later and you got it and you, oh, and it already, I mean, within just, just not very long, an hour, two hours, it, it's different. Or you put it in the refrigerator. You know, they come up with these two liter bottles. How many of you remember these things? It's a thing. It's a lid you put on a two liter bottle and you pump it. It keeps that, keep that pressure in there. And that works for a little while. But this is a, this is a, this is a Coke that uh, it's been open for a little while. So this is what happens again when you walk away and you expect the fizz. Not very much, is it? Well, that one's got a little bit. Watch this one. Mm. Now, I need someone to come up and this is a, a fresh glass. I haven't touched this. I need somebody to come drink this. Just now, it's going to be flat, isn't it? Because why? It's sat out. It's lost. It's lost its fizz. And I've just got one more that I want to show you. Because I think this one, this one represents... Uh, how, uh, you know, a lot of Christians are, they, it looks good, doesn't it? It looks good. And, um, it hasn't been open and listen for the fizz. Nothing, just 10, just 10 ripping. So this is like a lot of Christians. There's really nothing. There's nothing in there. It's just empty. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that, that scripture in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10, the very last one of those 19 things. It has a form of godliness. It has a form of looking like a Coke. But that verse goes on to say, but they deny the power therein that could make them godly. The New Living Translation says, I love that. They deny the power. They have a form of godliness. They have a form of looking religious, but on the inside, there's nothing. They deny that power, again, that could make them godly so let's make uh, let's make uh, the assumption here that and, and assume that Jesus truly is that Jesus is coming back again what should we be doing I think at the very least again we should be like the, the five wise virgins and make preparation for our life you know during this COVID-19 um, pandemic there is a uh, people are doing things businesses are doing different things um, uh, the other day I went to have a, have my ears checked at the uh, at the ear doctor uh, I know his ear guy, and uh, when I went in, before I could even go in the, the go up the steps to his, to his office, there was a lady there with the counter, and she was checking my temperature. Now, why are they doing that? They're just saying, if you've got a temperature, that doesn't, it doesn't say, okay, you've got COVID, but it's an indication that something, something's not right. So again, so people are doing things. They're making preparation for, for different things. And it's the, it, 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 I think the most important thing that we can do I think the most important thing that we can do in, in getting ready for the Lord Jesus Christ is number one is this, make sure you're born again. Make sure that you're born again. Make sure that you're born again. And, and be careful that you don't dismiss that, that, that thought, well, well, of course I'm born again. I was raised in a, I was raised in a Christian home. And that doesn't make you a Christian. You know that. Um, you know, well, I, 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 uh, I'm a member of a church. I, I've been going to City Gate Church for five years now. Now that means a lot. That, that means a lot. That gets you ahead of a lot of other people, a lot of other Christians. If you just come, come here to this church, 
But that, that alone won't get you to heaven. It'll get you some extra stars in heaven, but it won't get you to heaven. Is that right? That's right, Pastor. You, you're preaching good now. I hear you. But listen, I think, I think a, a, a great verse, a great verse to, to ex, is this, is the verse of examination. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. That's something that we need to do, not just once or twice in our life, but almost, almost on a weekly, if not a daily basis, examine ourselves to see if our faith is genuine. Test yourself. Surely you know that Christ Jesus is among you. One translation says, is in you. If not, you have failed to test of genuine faith. You have failed the test of genuine faith. So if he, if he is in there, if, if Je- the Lord Jesus Christ is, is only inside of us through the power, the person of the Holy Spirit, then there ought to be some evidence, wouldn't you say? I mean, if, if, if Christ is really on the inside of us, then there ought to be some evidence. What are some evidences of things that we could look for? So when again it says here, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. What would give me some indication, other than taking my temperature, what would give me some indication that the that, that, that I am genuinely saved. I think very simply that we could look to the fruit of the Spirit. Is there any love in you? Well, we know it's in you. If you're truly born again, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that the, that the love of God has been shed abroad into our heart by the Holy Spirit. So we've got the love of God on the inside of us, but examine yours. Are you walking in love? Are you, do you walk in forgiveness? Or are you, are you easily offended? Joy, what about joy? You know, I, come on, you all know some people that Christians that, man, they just, it looks like they have no joy in their life. They're grumpy. They're mean. It's, it's like, man, you would just, why don't you just go and enjoy yourself in the world because you're so grumpy. Anybody know anybody like that? I'm not looking in anybody's direction in particular because you may think I'm talking about you. <laughs> but love, joy, peace. Do you have peace? How about patience? Oh my God. Do we have patience? Sometimes I need to examine myself when I'm driving and ask myself, am I patient? I'm better. Aren't I getting better? Thank you for that overwhelming amen. I, I could, in my mind's eye, I saw you raising your hand and saying, thank you, Jesus. I am better. Yes, I am. I've got more patience. Kindness. Kindness. How about, here, here's one, here's another fruit of the Spirit. It's not listed among the nine, but I'm going to add it because it's the ability to see a change in other people. Yes. Yeah, you're lacking in that gift. <laughs> Goodness, faithfulness. Oh my gosh, faithfulness. Are you faithful? Who gets to, who gets to eat at the Lord's table? I mean, and who gets to eat at the banquet table? Who gets to eat there? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. This is Psalms, I think it's Psalms, Psalms 15, verse 1 through 5. And one of those is this, he who swears to his own hurt and changes not. You know what that means? It means if you've given your word to do something and a better opportunity comes up, you don't back out of the other thing because a better opportunity comes up. Let me give you a great example. You signed up, you're supposed to be an usher on, on Sunday, and all of a sudden a better opportunity comes up. Somebody came up with some tickets to a, some sporting event or something like this, and you don't show up and you just go to this because a better opportunity came up. Now, listen, I'm not saying that it's wrong to do that, but again, hey, get, your, get a replacement. You guys are looking at me like a cow looking at a new gate. Am I, am I, on, am I on Venus or something? <laughs> Self-control is another fruit of the Spirit that should be evident in our lives. All of those things should be evident in our life. Here, something else again, we're looking for evidence, evidence to the obedience of the, to the word of God. Are we walking in obedience to the revealed will of God? In fact, that's if you've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, that's what he's going to do. He's going to remind us of everything that the Bible says, especially those things that we've taught, that, that, that we've been taught ever since we were little kids. He'll bring those things to remind us so that because again, why is he reminding us? Because probably it might be evident that we're not doing those things. So listen again to the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Again, examine yourself. You know, sometimes people make the mistake of of looking at the wrong, I'll just use this term, a a measuring rod to to decide or to determine how their walk with the Lord is. For example, they'll pick somebody else. They'll pick maybe a a neighbor or a coworker, and you'll say, well, I'm better than they are. As though they're, and and they're bent like this, but hey, I'm straighter than they are, you know, because I'm like this. 
But again, that's not the right measuring rod that we look to other people. Now, as I say that, you know, I think of that verse, there was a verse in uh, Romans, where is it? Romans, Romans, Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, where Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So it's okay to, to follow people who, are, who you see as, as really following Christ, but don't make a mistake. They might be, again, I'm just going to use this as an example. They may be all bent over like this, but to you, again, who's like this, you think, wow, they're really following Christ. That's the, you've got to find somebody that's lined in, their life is lining up with the Bible to the best of their ability that God's helping them. Because what happens is when we follow people too close, when they go off in a ditch, we go off in a ditch with them. Follow someone that's following Christ, but if they go in a ditch, don't go in there with them. Here, you know, a great example of this is uh, there was a guy, how many of you have ever heard of a, a minister? This is, gosh, back in the early 1900s, John Alexander Dowie. I mean, I think he was from Australia. He was, I mean, amazingly used for, from, uh, used, uh, for God. God did amazing things for him. He, wore, he flowed in the the gifts of the spirit, uh, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. Uh, there was a guy, uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to call out his name. I'll just tell you because I don't want to. But there was a guy that he, this is several years ago, uh, probably 30, 40 years ago. I remember him growing up, this happened, uh, probably in my 20s. Uh, but he, would, he, had a, uh, he had an earpiece in, a microphone in his ear, and his wife was backstage, or someone was backstage, and they was feeding him information off of the registration cards that people put in. They put in prayer requests. You have a prayer request, and yes, my house caught on fire, and we don't have anything, and just pray for pray for our family, stuff like this. And he's calling out. There's someone I, I sense burning. There's something burning. Something something burning. And then is there somebody? In, I'm, I'm I'm hearing the name Wilma. Wilma. Is there a Wilma in here? Yes. Wilma. Is there something hot or something? But and she starts crying, and yes, and Wilma, your house burning, and just. Re- reading all this he's getting fed all this information well I'm telling you John Alexander Dowie had a microphone in his ear but it was coming from the Holy Ghost and he was telling him people's names their addresses their sickness the stage of their sickness I mean it was absolutely amazing but later in his life he went off into a ditch he began teaching people that he was the Elijah that was to come remember the, the Elijah was in a whirlwind and, and he's coming back. he is the he is the Elijah to come or he's he, began teaching people. So I'm seeing people that would follow that would, would be following him right down into a ditch. But the measuring rod, I think that we should ultimately use, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? That's what we're taught in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4, verse 13, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And listen, when I say that, you know, you may have a thought, I'll never get there. No, not on this side of heaven you won't, but that's still the goal. God says to us, he says, be ye holy, even as I am holy. So that's the standard of holiness. Will we get there this side of heaven? Not lugging around this old bag of flesh we got with us. But listen, we crucify our flesh and we try to be more and more and more like him. We're trying to grow up into the standard and to the measure of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oftentimes Christians will see areas that, and they'll determine that they're saved or that they're, they're going to heaven if they can check off these boxes. For example, like I attend church faithfully. I say my prayers. I read the Bible. I have scriptures memorized. Uh, I tithe. And so if they do those things, check, 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 I must be, again, examining myself because of the things that they're doing, that they're born again, that they're, that they're doing fine. But listen to what Jesus said to a man who was checked off all of those things. In John chapter 3, John chapter 3, there was a man named Nicodemus who was a religious man, a religious leader. He was a Pharisee. He had memorized scriptures because that was to be a Pharisee. You had to have all the, 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 the Pentateuch. Anybody know what the Pentateuch is? What is that? What's the Pentateuch? First five books. First five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Can you imagine how many of those you've read through the Bible? You've got one of those read through the Bible uh, in a year thing and you got through Genesis. Well, I've got a lot of good stories. Exodus, you know, the coming out of Israel. Leviticus. Oh my gosh. You get over into Leviticus and man, it's like a four wheel drive. Just all spins all the tires. That's the hard book, man, to read because all the laws and all of those things. But you, they had to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all five of those books. He had, he had, had those, talking about memorizing scripture. Uh, he fasted. Uh, as a Pharisee, you had to fast two days a week, which is two times more than most of us do. Uh, prayer, uh, he prayed. They had to pray. In fact, they had, they'd go out on street corners in prayer. They were praying so oftentimes for the wrong reason. But hey, I checked it off. I'm praying. Uh, he was faithful. Pharisees were, man, they were some of the most religious. And they loved God. 
They really did. They loved, they loved God. Uh, this particular guy, this particular Pharisee, was a, he was a, a leader in the Jewish ruling community, meant, mem, which meant he was a member of a group called the Sanhedrin. They were part of the ruling community within the, within the, within the uh, Israel's hierarchy there. So here's what Jesus, here's what happened in chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 2, a New Living Translation uh, Nicodemus comes up to Jesus after dark one evening and here's what he said. He, he came to Jesus and he said, Rabbi, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. And Jesus said to him, and Jesus turned and said to him, well, thank you. Thank you, Nicodemus. That's, that's very humbling, uh, but I appreciate you. And really, you shows you what a godly man you are because really only you could have gotten a revelation from God. So I know that you are a man of God. And that's not what Jesus said to him at all. Really what Jesus said to him in essence was this. After, after he said all of that flowery stuff to him, I know that you're from God and you can only, only the things that you do, you're going to hell. Listen to what Jesus said to him in the next verse. He says this, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you can't see you can't, you'll never see uh, the kingdom of God. All of these things, all of these things that, that Nicodemus was, was good and, and could be godly, but again, it does not, Jesus again says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And of course, at this point in time, Nicodemus couldn't be born again because Jesus hadn't died <clears throat> and rose from the dead. Isn't that right? Jesus had to die, shed his blood, but under the Old Testament, under the Old Testament, um, covenant as long as he was uh, doing his sacrifices and doing all those religious things he would be accounted as righteous but he couldn't be born again until Jesus until Jesus died so the point is this so in examining ourselves <clears throat> like the apostle Paul exhorted us to do in second Corinthians chapter 13 make sure that you have the right measuring rod make sure that you have the right measuring rod to determine if you're born again and the question is how did you get saved by the way how did you get saved? Let me pause just a moment and you tell me, and you don't have to tell me, but I want you to just to think it. I'll pick it up somehow. How did you get saved? What did you do? Think about that for just a moment. Go back in time. If you're here today and you're born again, if you're watching online and you are born again, how did you get saved? How'd you do that? Was it an individual? Was it in church? Was it, how did you get saved? Do you remember? Can you remember that? <clears throat> See, ultimately, God is the one who sets the standard. God is the one who sets the, the rod for eternal life. And unfortunately, there's a lot of ministers, pastors, teachers, Christians who will lead other people astray by, and I use this term, by preaching or talking a greasy, greasy, greasy grace message. And people believe because of that, that they're born again, when in fact, they're, they're really not. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. You know, it's one thing, <clears throat> it's one thing for Hollywood to do that, to mislead someone that they're, that they're every, everybody, in Hollywood, when, in a movie, everybody that dies goes to heaven, unless they're a horrible, horrible villain, and then they, they go into some sultry, smoky place, and you don't see them, but everybody pretty much that's a, the, the good guy in the movie, whether they, they're ungodly, they're sleeping with all kind of women in there, living in adultery, they, they all go to heaven. And, 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 and here's, here's an example. Um, <clears throat> and, and maybe there's some of you that know someone like this, know a situation like this. There was a guy, man, he, again, the fictitional, fictitious, fictitious character. You know, he lived, uh, he was just a scoundrel, man. He was mean. He was, he was uh, dirty dealing, uh, cheating people in his work. People uh, that he worked with knew him, knew his, knew his character. He wasn't a good guy. Like I said, he was, he was just a scoundrel. And something happened. He had a heart attack or he was killed uh, instantly in a car. And they're having funeral services. And, you know, a lot of people show up. And, and the, the minister, in, in, an, in an attempt to bring comfort to the family or maybe to the, to the man's children that are there or to the... To, to his co-workers and things, he says something like this, old Bob, you know, it's a terrible thing what happened to Bob, but Bob's in a better place now. Bob's in a better place. And people that worked with Bob, people that knew Bob, people that knew his character go, really? He, he, he's in a better place? Well, guys, then it's not that hard to get to heaven. Then I'll go there too. Do you know what I'm talking about? Remember Jesus said this, that more people will go to hell instead of heaven. 
more people will go to hell instead of going to heaven. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 says this. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many. Everybody say many. For the many who choose that way. Verse 14 says this. The gateway to life is very narrow. It's very narrow. And watch this. Jesus says, and the road is difficult. I, I like that. that he's, he's truthful. It's difficult. It's harder. The, the, the road that leads to the hell is it's, it's, it's easier. And he said this, but only a few. Remember the other one was many. The road that's, that's wide and broad, many is on that one going to hell. The narrow road, few find that road. And it's really simple if you think about it. More people are going to hell because hell is easier. It's an easier road to get on. And people will do what's easy. I, never, I always remember the story when I say a comment like that. I think of uh, Kenneth Hagin. It was, God used him greatly in the healing ministry. He said uh, a woman who came to one of his meetings, a healing meeting that they were having, uh, she had been to all the healing evangelists at that time. was like Oral Roberts, uh, Jack Coe, um, who were some others, Paula? Uh, huh? Catherine Kuhlman. Yeah, the, all these, these several people that were used that, and she still, still wasn't healed. She came to his meeting trying to get healed, and he talked to her. She said all this stuff. He says, well, I, think, I, said, I can help you. I can help you walk in and get, get your healing if you'll do what I tell you to do. Will you do it? She said, well, if it's easy. See, people are looking for something that's easy. Right. <clears throat> Here's another way to say it. It's easy to yield to your flesh, and it's harder to crucify your flesh. It's much easier to yield to your flesh and do what your flesh wants to do than it is to crucify your flesh and don't do what you, you know you shouldn't do. It's easier, listen to this, it's easier, at least for me, to want to give somebody a piece of my mind than to keep my big fat mouth shut and walk in love. Isn't it, isn't it easier to tell them something? You just want to smile. It's harder to keep your mouth shut. Keep your fingers off the keyboards. You know, sometimes it's good to write an email. Just don't send it. You say all the things that you want to say, and then you can ask for forgiveness, but don't send it. Because once you send it, you can still ask for forgiveness, but it's hard. <laughs> so perhaps the difference, maybe, maybe this is the difference between somebody that believes in Jesus and somebody that, that's a natural follower of him, is that they actually walk in these things. We read that verse earlier in 2 Corinthians 5, 13 about examining ourselves, and I think that's the key it's a key to being a follower of Christ. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. When we're examining ourselves, again, we're asking ourselves, how's my love walk? <clears throat> what am I doing with the things that God has blessed me with? God has blessed me. He's been so good to me. What am I doing with all of those blessings? Listen, is God pleased with me how that we're using the opportunities that he's given to us? I love this verse in Romans chapter 12. This won't be up on the screen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 out of the Message Bible. I love how it, what it says here. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you do it. And this is about really the only way that we can do this. God helping us to take your every day, your ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, your walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. See, I think sometimes we think when we think our, our giving our life to the Lord, we think we give it, we, we have this religious, we're giving him my religious life. I'm going to give him my Sunday. I'm going to give him this or that. But this is your ordinary, your everyday life, everything in your life. And again, it reminds me of a, of a book by a guy named Robert Munger. It was called Christ, uh, My Heart, Christ Home. And I've shared this with you before, but it's, it talks about our heart being a, a house with many different rooms. And so often we, we invite, we invite Jesus into our heart, but we, we have certain rooms like the family room in the kitchen. You, you know, you're welcome to come in in our study you can you can see our study that we all we've got all of our religious books out that, that we read and stuff but there's other rooms that we don't want him to see we don't we don't want him to go into the entertainment room we don't want him to go into to another room these these closets are, are, are off off limits but it's giving him everything every room he has he has freedom to go in throughout all of our heart and there's things that he'll walk in in our heart and he'll see and then it'll be embarrassing to us but we need to deal with those things that's what that's what examination is all about so again, walking around life, place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does, does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to the culture that you fit in without even thinking about it. Man, I, 
That to me, again, is the picture of a lot of where the church is a lot of times. We, we, we work in the world, we live in the world, and I'm telling you what, it's hard to be separate from the world when we have to be such a part of it. But we can do it if we use examin- examination. Examine in our lives. That's why it's good, not, not just a once every quarter, but almost daily. When I get up, when I go, God, how did I do today? God, was there anything in my life? Did I do anything? And if we'll just listen, if we'll just listen to the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, just say, uh uh-uh, no, don't do that. Come on, tell me. He's done that to you. You started to do something. You started to go somewhere, and you, you just had a, what we call a check in our spirit. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't say that. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it unless the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity God brings the best out of you develops well-formed maturity in you again that's Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 out of the message Bible so again and and, and when we're talking about times of of self-examination I think it's, it's it's a it's an awesome opportunity to bring God into that equation as well And that's what David did. David did in Psalms uh, 26, verse 2. The English Standard Version says this, prove me. The New American Standard says, examine me. So prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. Prove me. Test me. See if what I'm thinking, see if my the things that I'm doing are right. In Psalms 139, verse 23, once again, David says this. This is a great examination we're inviting the Lord to do. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. God, is there anything in my life that offends you? But we can't treat it like sometimes like we do prayer because remember when we did our prayer series, prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue. You know what that means, right? Prayer is a dialogue, where communication between two people, between us and God. A monologue is where we just go, and this is so many, and it's been part of my Christian life too, is talk to God, tell him what I need, and thank him for it, and then just to turn around and go without giving time for a dialogue. God, what do you want to say to me? My sheep know my voice. We know the voice. We know his voice. But sometimes, again, we, we just... God, search me. God, is there anything in me? God, is there anything in my life that offends you? God, if there is, let me know. We are out the door. Yeah. Maybe I'll tell you next time. But we need to give time again for God to hear. So a moment ago, you know, there in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, we talked about the broad road, which leads to hell, the narrow road that leads to heaven. A few verses later, in fact, seven verses later, uh, we, we see something here. Uh, Jesus says about these roads. He says, not everyone who calls on me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those, listen, only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter into heaven. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. What about those who said that, that repeated that prayer that the pastor prayed at church? Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Forgive me of all the wrong I've ever done. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Amen. And go out the door. Is that person saved? I'm not God. But I would say this, and I always say this. You'll note, you'll think back when I say this. Where after we pray that prayer, I'll say, if you meant business, if you mean what you say, we have a pamphlet we want to give you. We have a Bible that we want to give you. There's steps that we must. It, salvation doesn't cost you and I anything. It doesn't cause, Jesus did all the work. It was his blood that was shed. He paid out. We did the sinning. He did the payment. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. It's eternal separation from God. But Jesus went in and said, Father, I'll take their penalty. I'll pay their fine. And he did it for us, all of us. So we don't have to go to this place called hell. But now, becoming a follower, that's him, our Savior. But I, I don't know if he's your Savior if he's not our Lord. He's our Lord and Savior. The two go together. So again, here, only those who actually do the will of the Father in heaven. Now listen, I'm not saying that a person has to say that prayer and we say, go do it, go out, and if you meant business, get this and start reading. And they go out and, and, and they don't become a saint in, in our, you know, a full-fledged 40-year-old saint in, in three days. It's a process. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. I'm still repenting. I'm still, God's still searching me and calling ugly things out of me. That I believe with all my heart I'm going to heaven. 
because I meant business with God, I'm making efforts. I guess the problem I have is people that say that and they turn around, they do a 360 and they go back and they, and sometimes you never see them again and they never go, they just live, they just, there's no change. There's no change in their life. And according to the scripture, only those who actually do the will of my father in heaven. And on judgment day, many, remember seven verses before, where were the many going? They were on the broad road, remember? And many, <coughs> many, <coughs> <clears throat> it's that blasted Coke. <clears throat> and many will say to me, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I'll reply, I never knew you. Now, I want you to notice he doesn't say, look, I knew you one time, but you, you're like John Dow. You went off the deep road. He says, I never knew you. So they were doing those things, not knowing him. Get away from me, you who break God's law. Wow. Again, th those people, the things that those people were doing in verses 22 and 23, casting out devils, doing miracles in God's name, those were some pretty good things. And somebody says, well, you know, I, I, I remember one time I heard a story about Paul and Silas being in jail. I had Paul and Silas being in jail and and. And, and the, there was an earthquake and all the prison doors opened. The prisoner all had the opportunity to escape. And the, and the jailer just knew that the, the, he was going to get in trouble because all these prisoners escaped. So he took his sword. And he was going to fall on it and kill himself. And Paul said, no, no, don't do it. Don't do it. We're all here. We're all here. So he turned on the light and saw all the prisoners. They were still there. And then he says, he came to Paul and he fell down. And he said, what must I do to be saved? And here's what he said. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You and your household. That sounds pretty easy. But I think sometimes we miss something there. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? What does it mean? Never take a scripture like that or any one scripture and build a doctrine off of it. You know, I always say that. Don't, 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 don't take and say that, well, you know, if I tithe, God will open up the windows of heaven to me. Because the word of God works like this. It's like gears. They work together. God's word works together. It, you, you, you can tithe, but if you're a mean scoundrel, you don't treat your, talking about men, you don't treat your wives right. You don't, you know, your, your children, you're, you're, just, you're, you're, you're just not a good person, but you've got a hold. Somebody told you that this is a, this is a financial thing for you. If I'm tithing, then God will bless me. He said he would. And so I'm expecting the words of heaven. It works. The Bible says, to, talking to men, husbands, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, says if we don't, if we don't, if we leave a hurt, if we hurt our wives, and we don't take care of our wives, then God won't even hear our prayers. Much less open up the windows of heaven and bless us, but I tithe. It works together with the rest of the word. It's more than just believing that he is the son. What does it mean to believe on Jesus? Did you know the devil believes in Jesus? He doesn't believe on him. He, believe, he doesn't believe in him. He believes him. He, know, he knew him better than we do. He was in heaven with him. But one third of the demons that fell with him, they know. They know who he is. Are they going to happen because they believe on him? No. Listen to this statement. Faith Write this down. Faith is what we believe about Christ and our heart's response of trust that causes us to follow him as Lord and Savior. Faith is what we believe about Christ and our heart's response of trust that causes us to follow him as Lord and Savior. I want to say that one more time. Faith is what we believe about Christ. And you know that faith and trust are, are really interchangeable. I mean, faith and, faith and belief. I believe in Jesus. I trust in Jesus. I, I trust and I believe in this stool that it'll hold me up. I don't believe in it for salvation, but I believe it'll hold me up. Or to say, I trust in this stool to hold me up. Same thing, isn't it? It's interchangeable. Faith is what we believe about Christ and our heart's response of trust that causes us to follow him as Lord and Savior. You remember the scene? There's a scene in Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, where Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. He's walking by the Sea of Galilee. I've got about 45 more minutes. They just, they just must have got bored because I told them, don't leave, but they left. I'm just kidding. We didn't. Listen, so, so here's this scene. 
And he walks by the Sea of Galilee, and there's, there, there's, there's Peter and Andrew, who are brothers, and then there's James and John, who are brothers, and all four are partners in the fishing industry, okay? And Jesus goes by, and he says this. Jesus calls out to them. Now remember, get this picture. Jesus is walking by. This is Matthew. Matthew's telling us this. Jesus is walking by, and Jesus calls out to them and says, Come and follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets, and they followed him at once. My God, how awesome is that? I mean, what? They just, he just, he just walked by. Again, remember, this is, this is in Matthew 4. Jesus had really just came out of the Jordan being baptized, just came out of being from, from fasting, uh, fasting uh, 40 days and 40 nights. And so we're still in chapter 4. So he hadn't done a lot of miracles yet. So he just walking by and, and he said, hey, come follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. And these fishermen, these aren't religious people. These fishermen just drop everything and go follow him. You know what the deal is? Matthew speaks like a man. Man, you know how men are when they give you the details of their day, my wives? How was your day? Good. Yeah, Bob came to work late. He got fired. Well, what did he do? What, what's, the, what's the family going to do? I don't know. He came late work and he's, he's fired. Just the facts, ma'am. Now, Luke, however, is more, I don't know, he's a man. He's a, he's a doctor. He talks more like a woman. In Luke's gospel, we have a little bit more. The, the, the same incident, the same very incident, Jesus comes down to the seashore. There's a crowd of people that Matthew didn't tell us about that are there that are pushing against Jesus. He's trying to teach them. And he asked these fishermen who are fishing. That's what Matthew said. They were fishermen. That's what they do. And he says, hey, guys, that they just had fished all night. We didn't know this. For Matthew, had fished all night and didn't catch anything. I mean, they were tired. They were cleaning their nets. They were about done. Hey, would you guys, can I, can I just step in your boat here and push out so that so the, the crowd here is, they're, they're, they're about to push me, push me out here. And they did. And he preached a great message. And after he, he's done, he dismissed the crowd. And then he said, he said, hey, guys, let's push out a little bit and put your, put your nets in the thing. And they're like, oh, Peter said, master, teacher, <laughs> that was a great message that you just preached. I could never, I could never speak like this. See, this is, this is Luke's version. I could never teach like that. But I am a fisherman, and this is what I do. And the time to catch fish is over, and they weren't biting today. We'll come back tomorrow night. We'll try it again, but it's not now. And he just kind of looked, Jesus kind of looked at him, and he saw that look in his eye. He said, but master, because you just preached a great word, I will do it. And they went out there, and my God, that boat, they put down their nets, and that the, the fish started coming and coming and coming and coming and they started leaning the boat. They called James and John, come over, help us, help us. They started filling up their boat, their boat with the fish and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It's a little bit easier to see why they would do that after, my God, they are fishermen. They are professional fishermen. They've never, never seen anything like this. There's something about this man. And I bet you James and John's dad, Zebedee, who they were in business with, he said, go, go, go with him. <laughs> I guarantee you. So listen, so believe in, have faith in, trust in Jesus. It means, it means to believe and have faith and trust in the crucified, risen Lord and Christ, risen Christ as our personal Savior, Jesus Christ. Not just believe that He's God. Faith, listen to this, faith includes a heartfelt devotion and attachment. A heartfelt, what, I'm asking you, what does it mean to believe in God? It means to have a heartfelt, personal devotion and attachment to Jesus Christ that expresses itself in trust, in love, in gratitude, and in loyalty. That's what it means to believe in Christ. That's what it means to believe in Christ. So when we ask people, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, I believe he's the son of God. No, 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 no. Do you trust in him? Do you believe in him? It's not just believing because see so many times, and I did this, man, I'm telling you that I did this at eight years of age. I walked down the aisle of this Baptist church and I gave my heart to the Lord because that's what they said, that's what you're doing. You're getting saved. You're giving your heart to the Lord because I wanted to be baptized. I wanted to be baptized because all my friends were getting baptized. And the guy that was preaching preached a message on hell and I did not want to go to that place. So I gave my heart to the Lord as an eight-year-old kid. 
Monday morning, this eight-year-old kid, I, went, I was doing the same thing that eight-year-old kids do. I wasn't thinking about my belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wasn't thinking about being loyal to Him. I wasn't thinking about, God, am I, am I, am I okay with you today? And I wasn't examining my heart. But my God, at 19 years of age, in the middle of a field in Orlando, Florida, at a Jesus Music Festival, man, I put my hands up for the first time in the youth group. First time. First time in worship. And man, just tears just streamed down my face. And I could care less if anybody was looking, anybody, anybody, the other youth, I could care less what they thought about me. I believed in him. And now I want to know, God, am I doing anything wrong? God, am I doing anything? God, how can I be better? And that's the way I've thought ever since then. I don't know, maybe that's when I got born again and believed in him. Because I think a lot of times people, we, 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 we get, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's like when a, when, a, when a woman gets pregnant. There's life that begins there, but she hasn't had that baby yet. Maybe when it's the giving birth process is that nine month period. Maybe from, maybe from age eight years old to 19, I was pregnant. I was pregnant, but then I gave birth and life, life came. Life came to me. And I tell you, there's a lot of other people that'll say the same thing. They'll say, you know what? I, I, I got saved, but things didn't really change until a few years later, until now. And then I gave my life to the Lord. Things didn't really change for me. Is that's when our belief really comes. So again, all of this. What? What? Why? Did, why am I saying all of this? Why? Why did? Why did I preach this whole message today? Remember, it's on the heels of of Jesus is coming soon, and just asking the simple question: Am I born again? Do I really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You guys all look so, so holy, so sanctified. But you work with people who aren't. You're in neighborhoods with people who aren't. And if they don't know, and if they don't give their life to the Lord, let's tell you, they'll go to hell and spend all eternity there. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we confess today our belief in you. Lord, I believe in you. I trust you. Lord, if there's anything in my life, God, that's not pleasing unto you, God, reveal that to me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's all stand for just a moment. And would you just would you just take just a moment and maybe and confess that to the Lord, that your love for him. Say it where you can hear yourself. You know, the person next to you didn't have to, but just say it. Just whisper it. Lord Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. Oh, Lord Jesus. And God, if there's anything in me, God, if there's anything in me that's not pleasing unto you, God, if there's any way in my life, anything that I'm, that I'm doing, God, that offends you or that offends your word, God, I ask you to forgive me. Show me those things. Lord, and I'll commit to changing those things. Oh, Father, thank you today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work that you did on the cross. Thank you that you shed your blood for us. Thank you that you shed your blood for us. Listen, if you're here today, if you're listening online today, and maybe, say, maybe something I said, maybe the way that it was explained today, and I hope I, I hope I, I duly communicated what the Lord had on my heart. But there's that difference between just saying a simple prayer or just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and your house, you and your house will be saved. What does believe mean? Do you really believe in Him? Do you trust in Him? Do you rely on Him? Or are you loyal to Him? That's what it means to believe on Him. And if you're not there at that place today, I, I encourage you, make those things right with God. Make those things right with God. Listen, if, if the Lord tarried his coming, that means if he puts off his coming for a for hundred more years, we still should be doing these things. What should we be doing? What should you do until the Lord comes? Do what he's told you to do. do what he, if he's called you to be an electrician, be the best godly electrician you can be. If he's called you to be a doctor, be the best godly doctor you can be. If you're retired, be the best retired person you can be. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, we bless you today. We bless you. We bless your name. We worship you. We worship you. Father, I pray that there's anyone listening today. There's anyone listening today online. There's anyone here today, God. Father, your word tells us that there's no man, not one person comes to you unless they're drawn. And Father, I pray to God that they would feel, they would sense that drawing to you if they're not born again, if they're not truly born again. 
If they're like those that, that, that we're going to say on that day as we stand before you, I did this in your name and I did this in your name. I went to church in your name and I prayed and I did this. If they don't really know you, God, Holy Spirit, speak to them, lead them, draw them to you today. Draw them to you today. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen.